Stop me if this sounds familiar. You're playing a video game, maybe it's a JRPG, maybe it's a first-person shooter, heck, maybe it's a kid's game about a little pink guy who flies around on a star. And at first, it's pretty uncomplicated. It's a game. It's fun. It gets your mind off the real world and all its problems for a bit. But then, without you ever realizing it, the game takes a turn into the existential. What started out as a quest to retrieve a stolen item or save a cat from a tree has become a world-shattering mission to destroy God itself. You've been there, right? Escalation after escalation, eventually you reach the pinnacle of all challenges in the game. Some kind of divine overbeing more powerful than anything else the game world has to offer. It's easy to dismiss this as the natural progression, top of the difficulty curve, but it's kind of a weird role to just thrust someone into, right? We've touched on the concept of killing gods before in our How to Kill a God video, but since then, I've been thinking, what does it really mean to take on that kind of burden? What kind of person must you become? Who is this person that would defy their place in the cosmos and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the deity? Who has the audacity, the courage, the wherewithal? Who is the Godslayer? Having trouble writing? Well, there's a 14-part video series you can watch for free that I think will really help. It certainly helped me. The Creative Writing Bootcamp, taught by best-selling author Myla Goldberg. Check the description to see how you can get access to it and change how you think about writing forever without spending a dime. A big thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video and giving us the opportunity to tell you about it. This class has been a special one for me, and I feel really lucky to get to share it with you this way. When you think Godslayer, you probably think of a powerful, pissed-off warrior type punching and chainsawing their way through seven layers of hell. I mean, obviously that type of character could believably manage to take down a god, right? They certainly seem like they would have the tenacity for it, at least. But I think, in the spray of gibs and bullets, it can be easy to lose track of motivation. After all, even the most rage blind berserker probably has some reason for taking on this the task of all tasks, right? I guess it could just be for the fun of it. But usually there's some sort of powerful driving force, something to make volunteering themselves for what is surely a doomed mission worth all the trouble. What would push someone that far? For a lot of them, the answer is quite simple. Passion. The Doom franchise may strike you as one more associated with explosions of demon guts and epic metal soundtracks than anything even remotely introspective, but there's more to the main character, the Doomslayer, than you might expect. His origin story shows him being dishonorably discharged from the US Marines for refusing to fire on a crowd of unarmed civilians. At one point, he had a loving family, including, adorably, a pet rabbit named Daisy, who are eventually all killed by demons, which in turn prompts him to kill literally every single demon ever, including a few gods. We also see the Doomslayer carrying Daisy's foot on a keychain, not for luck, but as a reminder of innocence lost. I mean, it's pretty obvious that the whole Daisy thing originated as a bit of a joke. Like, oh, isn't it hilarious that this huge meat-headed killing machine had a pet bunny named Daisy? And, I mean, sure, I guess it is, but it also got more than a quick laugh out of me. Beneath the bloody, armed-to-the-teeth exterior, we know that this man has a sentimental core and at least something of a moral compass. The Daisy thing softens an otherwise impenetrably tough character. Even though a lot of the legwork there is done by irony, I bet a lot of players were fired up to blast through swarms of demons, and surprised to learn that it was basically all to avenge a bunny rabbit. The Doomslayer, as short-spoken and violent as he may be, is ultimately driven by his passion and grief, which I think is a far more interesting angle on his character than he kills demons because it's cool. You can see the same thing in Kratos, the hero of the legendary God of War series. His backstory is actually pretty similar to the Doomslayer's. He begins as a Spartan military captain with a beloved wife and child, 
who are, of course, eventually killed. The difference here is that Kratos is not carrying around a rabbit's foot with his pet's name on it. He doesn't have that much compassion in the earlier games. He sort of has to learn it much later in the series. In fact, it was Kratos himself who killed his family after making a deal with Ares, the god of war, for power. Kind of a deal with the devil situation. This sends Kratos on a harrowing quest to kill Ares, and while part of his motivation is avenging his family, a lot of it is also because he resents the gods for jerking him around and is desperate for a moment of peace. In the end, he does actually manage to do it, but as a result, he also ends up filling the vacancy left on Mount Olympus and becoming the god of war himself. Kratos goes through a pretty transformative character arc over the series, and you see his motivation take a similar path. In the first game, he's bitter about being tricked and being subjected to terrifying visions of what he did to his family, and sets out for revenge. In the more recent games, he's not mellow by any means, but after a long period of retirement, his decision to once again become a godslayer is ultimately driven by grief, exhaustion, and wanting to defend the new family he's created, as opposed to just lashing out out of raw anger. He makes the choice, this time not because he wants to, but because he feels that he must. So that's two muscle men with surprisingly tearful backstories driven to face down the divine. Honestly, there are probably a lot of those. Giving an ubermensch some emotionality is like the least you could do to possibly subvert the expectation for what a god slayer would look like. But here's an example you might not expect. A petite, otherwise unremarkable woman, dressed in a male kimono, holding a rifle. The movie Princess Mononoke presents a really interesting interpretation of the concept of godhood, giving that title to beings who are less creator deities and more incarnations, embodiments of nature, and in this context, Lady Eboshi is the perfect foil. Much more fitting for this particular task than a muscle-bound, gun-wielding, tormented super-soldier. When you first see her in the movie, there's no way not to respect her. She's strong, capable, compassionate, and beloved by all the people in her mining settlement, Iron Town. She takes care of lepers who would otherwise be abandoned to die. She rescues women from lives as brothel workers. Lady Eboshi has all the usual traits you'd associate with a hero, but she isn't. In fact, for the majority of the film, she's framed as a pretty formidable antagonist. In order to expand Iron Town's minds and finally get her people out from under the thumb of the local samurai for good, Lady Eboshi has her sights set on destroying a nearby forest. To do so, she needs to kill the gods who inhabit it. When the movie begins, she's already mortally injured Nago, the boar god, with an iron bullet manufactured in her city. Later on, she manages to wound Moro, the wolf goddess. At the climax of the film, she finally beheads the great forest spirit to calamitous effect. These deities never did anything to her. Their only crime was inhabiting a forest she wanted to take for her own. At the end of the film, she realizes that she's caused unnecessary suffering and vows to change her ways, but that doesn't undo the damage that she's done. Lady Eboshi can't really be considered evil, and her desire to protect her people is just as admirable as Kratos or the Doomslayers. But she is still wrong. The gods she slays aren't heartless demons or power-hungry villains. They're just animals hanging out in the woods. In many cases, these godslayers are justified in their murderous rampages. They're facing the impossible, and often doing it from a place of blind passion. Very much a David versus Goliath situation. But Lady Eboshi is distinct in that she is not a victim of the gods. She is their predator. Although she is doing it from a place of passion, trying to protect the well-being of her people, she is still the aggressor in this story, which is kind of an interesting, unique position. Perhaps, in a way, more reminiscent of reality and how human progress has interacted with the very concept of the divine. Whatever their qualities may be, Tormented muscle man, reformed berserker, progressive iconoclast, one thing all of these characters have in common is the agency to choose this path. Yes, the Doomslayer is technically saving the world by tearing these demons and angels and pseudo-divine beings apart, but nobody is forcing him to. 
Kratos was the one who initiated his original deal with Ares, and it was Kratos' decision afterward to devote the remainder of his life to slaying the god. Lady Eboshi is trying to do the right thing for her people, but even she recognizes afterward that it was her decision to shed the blood of gods in that pursuit. Okay, all of that is true, these godslayers made this choice, but what happens when it's not a choice? What about all the godslayers who are forced into their role? What about when it's not a matter of personal values or desires, but a simple matter of fate? This, in my opinion, is where these characters start to get really interesting. Knowing that you are destined to do something so incredibly daunting, whether you want to or not, is bound to change how you interact with it. We made a video about the Chosen One archetype a while back, and in it we talk about the unfairness of fate and the bitterness one might feel at predestination. This is no different. It just guarantees very high stakes. In the show Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Buffy Summers is a high schooler who is also the one person in her generation tasked with monster hunting. At first, it's not exactly the ideal situation for her. Having to juggle final exams with vampire slaying reasonably makes her a little resentful. Often, she wishes she were just some normal kid without this burden thrust upon her. But over the course of the show, as she becomes more confident in her own abilities and cognizant of the threat she's meant to face, although it's still a burden on her, she begins to lean more into her role. By season 5, she's become the girl she needs to be to take on Glory, the goddess of hell who drains people of their sanity. It hits especially hard because, as the characters deal with the neurological fallout of Glory's brain sucking, Buffy is also dealing with the death of her own mother due to a tragic brain aneurysm. It's not hard to see how this whole thing would feel especially personal for her. This is also why I think Glory is one of the series' best villains. By the time Buffy is prepared to face her, we can tell this isn't just a goofy Monster of the Week show anymore. Buffy is shaken out of her role as a reluctant hero, and now her fate is aligned with what she personally wants. It's a great demonstration of what it can take for someone to bridge the gap from indifference to having the same kind of passion we saw in those other godslayers. Enough to bring down a literal goddess. Okay, I love that arc, but I think my favorite example of this trope is also, weirdly, less triumphant. It's another character driven to this almost insurmountable challenge by fate, but unlike Buffy and the rest, they never quite turn into an impassioned, god-slaying super-soldier. Not really. The Chosen Undead from the first Dark Souls game is unique in that it's the Chosen One, but also not. Throughout the game, you're told that you're either fated to save the world from an impending age of darkness, or become the lord of that darkness and usher it in. In either case, to do so you'll have to defeat not one, but a variety of godlike beings. And... Prophecy notwithstanding, as the chosen undead, failure is a distinct possibility for you. In fact, you could almost say it's the expectation. See, you are not the only chosen undead. Cursed to return to life until all their humanity is used up, bearers of the dark sign like you turn out to be a somewhat reliable way to ensure this prophecy is fulfilled. With nigh infinite attempts, one of you is bound to be the destined godslayer. Unlike Buffy or Kratos or the Doomslayer, you're nobody special in Dark Souls. You're just a fragile little undead who has to earn your way to victory. Technically, you could give up. Goodness knows how many others did before you. But then, what's the alternative? Wither away in the dark with all the other undead who are too cowardly to try until you, too, become a mindless husk? If your only two options are to suffer for eternity or to square off with literal gods in an attempt to avoid that fate, there's really no reason not to choose the latter, is there? As I said, a far less triumphal arc than all the ones who are really passionate about their path, yes, but there really is something incredible about the idea of a hero so small, so fallible, so unlikely, surmounting this, the greatest challenge of all, isn't there? So, who is the Godslayer? 
The defining quality shared by every version of this trope, regardless of their motivations or background, is that they are so much smaller, so much weaker, and so much less in control of their reality than the forces they're arrayed against. And, nevertheless, whether by the somewhat ironic power of divine intervention, technology, or just dogged determination, these characters rise to the challenge. It's fantastic to watch. But here's the catch. In the process of becoming the Godslayer, they also accumulate so much power that they themselves become something akin to a deity. This, I think, is my favorite thing about this archetype. It comes with a built-in, pre-packaged, almost unavoidable conflict. It's incredible to watch a mortal reach such heights and achieve such things. On the other hand, it also looks like a departure from mortality, doesn't it? We shared a quote from Friedrich Nietzsche in our How to Kill a God video, but I think it bears repeating here. When contemplating the idea of killing God, even in a metaphorical sense, he asks the question, is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must we ourselves not become gods simply to appear worthy of it? It's the nuclear weapon developed to deter other nuclear weapons, the gun on your belt meant to protect you from other guns, the thorny exterior meant to shield you from the cruelty of others. To defeat the all-powerful being, you must take that power for yourself. In trying to master their reality, these are characters who slay the very gods, but lose themselves. Now, of course, the best way to experiment with this would be to try writing a little bit of it yourself. My greatest hope is that at the end of these videos, you come away feeling that spark, the desire to make something up. But writing, even at the best of times, is a really difficult practice to start. It can take years for some authors just to work up the courage to begin. Fortunately, a while back I found something that will absolutely help you. It's a 14-part video series called Creative Writing Bootcamp, and it just… it gives you so much to work with if you're a new writer. There are things in here that I wish I'd been told 10 years ago. Things like where ideas come from, how to relate to your characters, how to write conversations, settings, even how to go against the common wisdom and write what you don't know. The series was put together by best-selling author Myla Goldberg, and her enthusiasm and joy as she teaches is absolutely contagious. You will end the series ready to write something. And thanks to our sponsor Skillshare, you can actually watch it for free. I personally would sign up for this course alone, but you'll also get access to thousands of other classes as well. Experts from pretty much every discipline have gathered there to share their knowledge and experience. There are classes on creative writing, illustration, fine art, animation, graphic design, film and video, pretty much anything you can imagine. You can even join in on live classes, connecting with other creatives and teachers while you learn. And if you're feeling anxious about where to start with all of this new stuff before you, Skillshare has actually made that quite easy too. Now, instead of having to find your own way through Skillshare, you can use Skillshare's curated learning paths to take you through a variety of classes from different creators, tailored to suit more specific learning journeys than any one creator could offer. After talking with them about it, it seems like the people over at Skillshare can really see why we're so excited about this writing class, so they've decided to give you the opportunity to experience it, and any other Skillshare class that catches your interest, for free. This month, the first 500 Tail Foundry fans who join the Skillshare community will get a complete 30-day trial for free. That's one whole month of free learning. Who knows how much you could discover in that time alone? Click the link in the description or the link right at the end of this video to get started. And I would definitely hurry because those slots are going to fill up fast. Once you've finished Myla Goldberg's Creative Writing Bootcamp, please come back to tell us the impact it's had on you as a writer. I cannot wait to hear the success stories. Anyway, that's all for this one. Thanks for watching and keep making stuff up. I'll see you next week. Bye.